Good afternoon. My name is Enid Slack, and I am the director of the Institute on Municipal Finance and Governance here at the Monk School of Global Affairs. On behalf of the chair of our board, Alan Broadbent, who's here, and Shirley Hoy, who's also on our board, and also the members of our staff, I would like to welcome you to today's session on what makes a resilient city. We are delighted to be partnering for today's event with 100 Resilient Cities, 100 RC, pioneered by the Rockefeller Foundation. If you are tweeting this event, and we encourage you to do that, uh, our Twitter handle is at IMFG Toronto. Our hashtag is IMFG Talks. Before we begin, I wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home of many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. IMFG is really happy to co-host this event because we are interested, as you all are, in resilient cities. One of our research themes over the course of this past year has been about climate change and cities. We have published two papers so far on this topic, one on climate change, floods, and municipal risk sharing, and one on effective steering strategies for cities to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We're also excited to be co-hosting this event because the City of Toronto has recently hired its first Chief Resilience Officer, Elliot Capel, who will be introduced to you shortly. What is a CRO? What is a Chief Resilience Officer, you might ask? Well, that's what we're here to find out about today. But in general terms, I think the CRO's job is to prepare the city for shocks like natural disasters, like we've seen recently in Florida and the Caribbean, but also uh, to respond to long-term stresses arising from inequality, for example. So today we will hear from Elliot about what he thinks resilience means and how he plans to make Toronto a resilient city in the next two years. <laughs> Elliot will be joined by CROs from New York and Montreal who will talk about what they've learned so far in their roles and what they plan for the future. They've been at it for a bit longer than Elliot, so I think we have some things we can learn from them. So now I would like to introduce our moderator for today, Otis Rowley. Otis is the Regional Director for City and Practice Management in North America for 100 Resilient Cities. And I think Otis told me there are 20, 28 uh, resilient cities uh, in North America so far. Otis has a very impressive resume, but I don't want to take our whole time going through it. So let me just say his entire career has been dedicated towards resilience and urban development in the private, nonprofit, and public sectors. He's worked in housing, community economic development, strategic planning, performance management, municipal administration, and urban, regional, and transportation planning. Before joining 100RC, Otis was the CEO of Newark's Economic Development Corporation. Please welcome Otis Rowley. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Um, uh, so I, I'm really honored to be here today. It is um, sadly only my second time in uh, Toronto. Uh, the first time was uh, was far too quick, um, and I have fallen in love uh, with your city. We're trying to figure out how we boo the Rockefellers' offices from Manhattan. Um, <laughs> That was the CRO of, of uh, New York City saying no. Um, <laughs> so I want to thank you so much, uh, all of you, for, for being here today. Um, I want to talk to you a bit about, um, about what is resilience and um, what 100RC is and why the Rockefeller Foundation thought it was crucial for us to, to kind of begin this work. First and foremost, it's just I think we recognize cities as, as crucial uh, to the success of, of the globe. We think that all work um, towards the advancement of, of humankind um, can in many ways be encapsulated in, in our work in cities. 
Uh, why do we feel that way, right? Because so much of the world's population is in cities, and if you're going to have a, a dent, make a dent in creating kind of real substantive change, uh, you can do that when you, when you focus in your efforts uh, and the work that's occurring in cities. 54% of the world's population today is in, uh, is in cities, and, and that is just continuously growing. We, we know that um, with more than half of the world's population located in these metro centers, uh, it's important for us to focus our attention there. We also recognize from an economic standpoint that over three-fourths of the GDP of, of the world uh, actually occurs in, um, in our cities and is coming out of our cities. And we hope that by the time I leave this room today uh, that you will have a, a, a keen love for resilience um, I'm assuming all of you already have a, a deep love for cities, but that you have a keen love for resilience and an understanding of what we mean when we talk about resilience. So whether, whether you are looking at uh, the flooding in, uh, in Indonesia, the kind of very, fairly recent uh, hurricanes that have uh, affected uh, the U.S. and Canada, whether it's, it's the infrastructure uh, failures that are occurring uh, throughout, throughout the globe, um, pandemic or public health issues in, in Kenya and around, around the world, uh, these public health emergencies. Uh, whether you're thinking of kind of the urbanization that, that occurs, uh, the rapid urbanization that results in, uh, in very kind of serious traffic jams and, um, and the intense density that helps to facilitate uh, um, the, the reality of folks just being kind of jam-packed in, in many of our cities. Uh, and the globalization that also shows us that, did you know that um, almost 70% of every single uh, kind of Christmas, uh, Christmas resource is actually produced in one, one city uh, in, in China? Almost 70%. Um, so there's, there's just the reality that we are talking about a, a huge globe that is in many ways large yet, yet small. Uh, the world we're living in today is very much facing challenges uh, that are unprecedented. And, and not just in terms of unprecedented in recent history, but in human history. And our world is more interconnected and interdependent than it has, it has ever been. Uh, so because of this, um, we feel like the time is now to build resilience. Uh, in cities around the globe, there's a huge opportunity. And because the cities of tomorrow, uh, which will have more people, more infrastructure, and more challenges are being built today, uh, with the estimates that there's a stagnant 75% of urban infrastructure that will exist in 2050, doesn't even exist yet. 75%. Uh, so there's an enormous amount of power and ability for us to create substantive change now if we get it, if we get it right. Um, so planning for a dynamic future is, is the task at hand, and cities have the potential to be the greatest engine of prosperity and economic equality that the world has ever seen. So in 2013, um, the Rockefeller Foundation pioneered 100 Resilient Cities. It's a global organization uh, that provides funding, strategy development, and ongoing support to a network of cities around the globe. Uh, we have 100 cities. I, I help to lead the work in, uh, in the United States and Canada. We have four cities in Canada and uh, 24 in, in the U.S. Um, and we believe that in the face of the physical, social, and economic challenges uh, that these cities are facing, uh, that we can make solutions available now, globally, that will spread out uh, beyond the 100 to the 10,000 cities that exist. Um, but we have a very specific definition of resilience. I, as I was sitting and kind of preparing for for um, this presentation, I was listening to the crowd, and um, some people were talking about kind of their, um, they said, well, when I think about res uh, resilience, they think about their kind of personal resilience. Others were talking about it from a kind of a very environmental uh, focus. Uh, for us, we talk about urban resilience as the capacity of individuals, communities, institutions, businesses, and systems within a city to survive, adapt, and grow, right? No matter what kind of chronic stresses and acute shocks that they may experience. Right? This is particularly interesting because if you think about it, most people, when, you think, when they talk of resilience, they're thinking about your ability to, to bounce back. 
um, when someone has faced personal tragedy and, and, and they're strong and standing, standing upright and say, wow, they were really resilient. Right? Um, but we're talking about not just surviving, Right? Not just being able to, to get over that, that hurdle, right? but we're talking about surviving, adapting, and growing despite the, the stress or shock that, that one may face. Um, and this is our technical definition of resilience, and it's the definition that our 100 cities have, has adopted. And it's the definition that we feel truly captures uh, what is urban resilience. Um, so for, for us, you all probably have heard the, the term um, resilience in your, your context, but if you think of it in terms of the way I've kind of just laid it out, um, we are really talking about those shocks and stresses uh, that, that, you're, that you have to deal with and, and be able to adapt and grow through. Right? And so for us, when we say acute shocks, we're talking about um, these once in, once in a blue moon type of events, whether it's a tornado or a hurricane, as, as we are most recently dealing with in, in the U.S. and Canada, whether it's a terrorist attack. It can be um, a civil unrest or a riot. It is a kind of a one-time acute event that occurs uh, within, within the city. Um, flooding um, could, could be an acute shock that, that occurs. Uh, granted, though, and depending on, we have 100 cities globally, uh, one city's acute shock uh, in many ways can be a, a stress in a, in a different city. Uh, in the U.S. context, in the Canadian context, often a, a, terroristic, a terrorist attack would be a, um, an acute shock, while we have other cities within our network where, sadly, it is, it is a stress uh, that they are, are dealing with. Uh, and so when we, we talk about these, these chronic stresses, it is those things that constantly are tearing away at, uh, at, at the, the city's overall kind of health and, and well-being. It, is, it can be ongoing um, kind of uh, uh, affordable um, lack of affordable housing. It can be uh, systemic racism. Um, it, is, it is those things that are constantly, uh, slowly kind of dripping and dealing, that you are dealing with, that affects your overall ability to be a resilient city. And so when cities are able to recognize the connection be, between uh, these, these challenges and these shocks and these stresses uh, and plan for them, uh, we feel that they are, um, are in a, a state of urban resilience. Right? Our 100 cities, let us be 100% clear, uh, our 100 cities are not already resilient. None of, the, none of our CROs have an R uh, tattooed on their chest. Um, they, they all, uh, <laughs> Louis said, no, I do. Um, <laughs> um, but the, the reality is that um, all of us is through this very competitive uh, comp competition, recognize that they wanted and could be more resilient. Right? There were over 1,200 cities applied to be part of 100 resilient cities. Um, and the 100 that, that were accepted had what it, uh, it takes to actually do what is necessary to achieve the, that resilience. Believe me, there were some cities that applied that were not very self-aware um, and, and thought that they were already really resilient. And, and that's why they, they did not necessarily get uh, accepted into the network. Right? Um, but we, we are so pleased uh, that Toronto is, is one of these cities. And I want to talk to you about another one of these cities that uh, it's currently um, um, dealing with some of the resilience challenges and how they are dealing with it. It's a great example um, in uh, Norfolk, Virginia, in the U.S. Uh, we have a, a very strong partnership with Norfolk. It's one of our first cities. It faces some pr pretty serious challenges. It's the home of the world's actually largest naval uh, base um, and is often called the most flood-prone city in the United States due to sea level rise, river flooding, and land subsidence. In, in other words, um, this city is sinking. Right? It is very much sinking. People think of kind of Particularly in the U.S. context, you think of New Orleans or Miami. Often, when you or the fear of, of flooding compares uh, to Norfolk in terms of uh, some of those the issues. Um, and antidotes aside, uh, the city faces even even bigger threats um, uh, when you look at some of the issues and challenges and problems that they face related to um, to equity um, and, and related to poverty, economic um, em empowerment, social mobility, and so. This city really took it upon themselves uh, to recognize that their resilience challenges and their full scope, right, uh, and their their resilience strategy uh, did not just try to deal with issues related 
um, related to the flooding uh, that would occur there, but also how do you better connect the citizenry to employment opportunities, right? How do you create better social cohesion uh, within the various neighborhoods and, and communities uh, within the city of Norfolk? Um, and so it has helped lead to great, great success in terms of also the, um, from an economic perspective, the bond rating agencies look counting Norfolk, Virginia's uh, resilience strategy as one of the reasons why the city actually did not uh, get downgraded. Um, and particularly within the U.S. Uh, context, many of the other mayors um, um, started paying a little bit more attention uh, when they recognize uh, the the uh, the benefit there that others are recognizing the rec the resilience dividend of of both preparing in terms of your physical infrastructure to some of your environmental challenges, but also investing in and preparing your social and human infrastructure, um, because in in those ways you will truly truly achieve resilience. Um, the, it was it was a very much uh, a kind of top down and bottom up process that occurred in in the city of Norfolk uh, in terms of their steering committee in terms of the working groups in terms of those individuals that played a very activist role in the government the uh, business community the uh, residential community city practitioners all rose to the challenge um, and helped to participate in the overall overall strategy um, and I'm excited uh, that as you embark on this work here in Toronto that you some of those same things will occur I love this quote um, from, from Christine. Says, We've tried to provide an opportunity for residents to use the design process as we explore what, is going, what um, it's going to look like to live in Norfolk in another 50 to 100 years. Right? Often it is very difficult uh, for, for folks to think about, you know, to think about just even five to 10 years down the road. Uh, but through some real creative activities, um, they, were really, they really empowered people by pushing the envelope a bit uh, in talking in 50 and 100 year horizons, uh, it took people out of their usual kind of comfort zone, right? So when you think about uh, new development maybe poten potentially happening in your neighborhood or your community, it might freak you out a little bit um, just from basic kind of nimbyism, right? But when you're thinking 50 years out, it's, it is easy for you to say, okay, well, you know, I probably won't even be here anymore. I'll, I'll you know, be a little old. And you're able, it gives you so, certain levels of freedom uh, to really explore some ideas that you wouldn't traditionally explore. And it was, a, it was an interesting approach that, that, they, did, that they took, and it, it really helped um, the, the residential community, the business community, and government to, to be uh, very creative. And so the plan, the strategy that developed out of this, did not, though, just look in the 50, 100-year horizon. Um, but because they were free to think a little bigger and broader, um, because they planned in that context, they were able to... Um, help to facilitate ideas in the short term, medium term, and long term that they would not necessarily have done if they had just planned in a, in a kind of a three, five year horizon. Um, and I think there's also, there's some really cool lessons to be learned uh, from, uh, from what they did there. Uh, I, I wanted to also just some of, uh, some of the cities often that we go into, they, the people say, okay, well, Rockefeller's in, in town. Um, please make the check payable too. Um, and, and, and that's, that's, that's fine. Uh, but what, uh, because I do think, you know, to talk about it is one thing, but to be about it, meaning signing those checks is very important, right? Um, uh, but I wanted to make it crystal clear when one of the cities, when any of our 100 cities, once they become part of 100 resilient cities, what, is, what does that mean? So immediately, um, the, the, there are really kind of five core pieces that, that you get as a member city. One, we pay for uh, the chief resilience officer uh, for, for two years, right? And it's our thinking in terms of salary and benefits, it's our thinking that if we can take that headache away from the city uh, for the, at least those first two years, that they can do the things necessary to, to, uh, to step up, to match. Um, in our first wave of, of like 33, 34 cities, that, that was a little uh, uh, tougher, and uh, even though the cities competed for it. And, but the third wave, it was less tough because mayors talked to mayors, city managers talked to city managers, um, and, uh, and it was a bit of a more of a reputation. So people said, oh, no, we know about the return on investment here. Um, and uh, for example, the city of Atlanta, um, you know, we paid for the chief resilience officer. The city um, merged their resilience office and uh, sustainability office and, and, and hired eight additional staff members to so now you know, the CR as the staff of 20 um, for this now broader Office of Resilience. 
and great, right? Um, but all on, and um, in this Norfolk, which I talked about uh, earlier, um, we you know paid for the chief resilience officer in the city, paid for the deputy uh, resilience officer, and Christine is you know kicking butt and taking names, is a highly planning technical term, uh, to um, with with a staff of two, right? Um, so it's, it depends on on the reality of the staff, but that we do that uh, to help to deal with that that uh, initial challenge. We also pay for the resilience strategy work to be done. Ultimately, that work is owned by the city, right? The chief resilience officer and, and you as their partners put, prepare that work, um, but we, uh, we pay for a global partner to, to assist in, in helping to do that, to do that strategy. Um, the platform, we have a platform of partners worth over $250 million to help you implement your strategy, right? So these are um, nonprofit, for-profit, academic institutions that have stepped up to be part of the solution here. Um, and, and it's often very helpful in our city context where sometimes politics can be interesting um, to not have to worry about procurement uh, the, um, and some of the other issues because it comes directly out of, of, the, of the platform. And this is a full kind of Soup to nuts. It can be economic development analysis. It can be um, a heat wave uh, review. It can be um, uh, um, uh, Microsoft that does some work around uh, cybersecurity. All very different things depending on the shocks or stresses that you're dealing with. Um, and we bring that to bear. Then there's the global network. Elliott now has 99, actually, uh, 101. Uh, other because this, this Miami came in um, as a metro area, so they had three CROs uh, in in Miami. But um, there, um, he has partners that he can talk to and work with um, from all these different cities. And, and two members of the network are here today, right? And they they learn from each other, from each other's successes, um, from mistakes. Right? And and we help to facilitate that 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 network. We help to finance folks like traveling back and forth. Um, we we have a technology backbone as well to make those connections. And and then we also help to put pull together uh, reports to share out. Uh, our learning, not just to our network, but, but to the globe. Uh, and then finally, uh, we offer, uh, we offer within 100 Brazilian cities, actually about 100 staff members, all of which have a deeply in, uh, entrenched in terms of they have a deep, rich history in, in urban work. Um, we're not kind of the typical uh, program officers that sometimes you, you may deal with uh, in, in, within foundations. Um, out my, my colleague, who uh, the associate director who leads all the Canadian work, who's here, Olivia Stan, uh, Stinson, it does, does, has a rich background in municipal service, who understands cities, um, and, is, and um, I, as, as you've heard, have done a lot of work with, throughout municipalities. I've worked for five different mayors. And so when I talk to, uh, to a CRO about an issue, I'm talking to a city manager about an issue, we can compare scars. Uh, in a real way, um, and we can actually partner in a substantive way to try to help to achieve great resilience. And so these are these are the the things that we bring to bear in helping our cities. But the most important part to us is around implementation. This strategy work is so important. It is so important, and your participation is so important to help to make sure that this strategy is one that reflects the true shocks and stresses of of Toronto. But it does not matter if it is just a strategy that looks really cute. Right? What matters to us is implementation, and that's where the real power comes. That's where the real resources um, of the $4 billion, uh, last time I checked, uh, the Rockefeller Foundation can bring to bear, and then the partnerships uh, that we hope to, um, to facilitate with other foundations, with the private sector, and with you to help to implement uh, the work within, uh, within the city. So... With that, I, I want to um, show you a brief, uh, a br brief video, and then we're going to turn it over, uh, and we're going to have a panel uh, with uh, with our CROs to talk a little bit more about resilience. Our hearts yearn for best in life. It is very, very important that cities answer the challenges of real social issues. Who knows what's going to happen, so maybe we should be preparing for what we don't expect, expect the unexpected. A resilient community actually knows how to respond no matter what happens. It's very clear that we are faced with a number of problems, both emanating from nature and, and man. We have to consider that everything is done keeping resilience in mind. 
it is a step going from reactive to proactive. The inception of 100RC um, from the substantive side starts with Rockefeller's deep engagement in cities for decades. In 2013, the foundation was celebrating its centennial anniversary and it wanted to make a big statement. And it looked around the world and it saw three major trends, urbanization, globalization, and climate change. More than 50% of the world's population for the first time now lives in cities. And that number is expected to grow to 70% by the year 2050. Globalization refers to the fact that what happens in one city now more and more affects what goes on in another. More and more cities are at risk to the effects of climate change. They sit in the, some of the most vulnerable uh, areas, whether that's river deltas, on coastlines, or in high plains that are, are more impacted by drought and rainfall shortage. And so, in order to recognize both their centennial, but also be responsive to these macro trends, uh, the foundation announced 100 Resilient Cities. The four core offerings for 100 Resilient Cities First, a Chief Resilience Officer. Second, help and assistance in creating a resilience strategy. Third, access to a platform of services and partners. Fourth, access to a network of cities and Chief Resilience Officers. The Chief Resilience Officer is that single point of contact in a city. Someone who has the trust of the city's leadership, ideally works closely with the mayor, but is also able to work throughout all the different silos of city government, and throughout all the different silos of the city itself. Mais le fait que les CRO soient positionnés à un niveau hiérarchique élevé dans les organisations municipales euh, est réellement susceptible de nous aider à conduire notre mission de la meilleure, meilleure manière possible. So the first thing that a CRO does after they're hired is begin to develop a resilient strategy for their city. And the first part of undertaking that strategy is like taking a physical for the city. They need to understand what the overall resilience health is. So where they're strong and where they're weak, where they're healthy and where they're fit and where they're not. A lot of the planning processes and strategies that are developed are about the strategy itself and then you're done. And with 100 Resilient Cities in this process, it's really about implementation. To help the cities actually solve their challenges, there will be access to a platform of services. 100 Resilient Cities platform is a funded suite of tools, services, advisory support from the leading nonprofit, academic, and corporate sector partners who have all contributed their time and resources to help our cities execute upon their resilience strategies and achieve their resilience goals. The quality of the partners that are accessible to us is really something a city like Norfolk just couldn't afford. In addition to all of the great platform resources, this is when the network actually of all of these global CROs can provide one city all of their global institutional knowledge. La oportunidad que tuvimos de encontrarnos con otros CROs, de saber que no estábamos solos, no que hacíamos parte de una red, de una red con un compromiso mayor con el mundo. The city has to believe in what they're trying to achieve. They have to identify with the risks and exposures, and then we can figure out how to complement that. We can't accomplish very much as a platform partner without the motivated city behind it. So I go back to my city, fired up, and absolutely sure that I will engage even more with my chief resilience officer to put this right at the heart of what we do. We are working in a hundred cities with the aspiration of sparking a resilience revolution in 10,000 cities around the world. As the hundred are built out and they are working together, they actually, we hope, will become the linchpin of a global movement around building resilience. They will represent six continents, they will represent a depth of understanding about what resilience means and how to build it. Cities are the future, they're both our biggest risk and our greatest hope to solve climate change, to solve sectarian conflict, to solve overpopulation, crowding, human needs issues. So that's really the long-term play for us. 100 is great, 10,000 is game-changing.
Um, now you have the, the great pleasure uh, to hear from uh, three of our uh, chief resilience officers uh, from the city of Montreal, the city of New York, and your hometown, the city of Toronto. Um, so Louise, Dan, and Elliot, will you please join me up here? Good afternoon, everybody. How you doing? It's my first trip to Toronto. Forgive me. I've never had the pleasure of actually enjoying this great city, and I feel so many um, kindred things about this city uh, coming from New York, just the diversity and the, the vibrancy of, of a city like this, and it's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, I was just pondering a little bit the title of the, the session today, what makes a, a resilient city? And just the sort of quick thought came into my head, just stick around a little while because enough stuff is going to happen that's going to make you need to be resilient. And I just think back over the last 20 years in New York City, we've seen massive terrorist attacks, a citywide blackout, two, two hurricanes, a, a small earthquake, a few tornadoes, an economic downturn uh, that almost took Wall Street to its knees and had rippling ramifications uh, all across uh, the economic sectors in, in New York City. Um, I could go on and on. The last 20 years, we've seen a ton of things happen. And I bet you could probably have that same conversation across many other cities. And after each one, we've been able to come, come back a little bit stronger, a little bit better. But I think what was maybe too common in those situations was one of those things happened, okay, we're going to do some planning to make sure that thing never happens again. Okay, well, so then we plan for one thing. And as we've seen, the next thing is usually not the last thing um, through history. And Hurricane Sandy really was a major turning point for us in our resilience journey as a city. This is, we're almost approaching the fifth anniversary of Hurricane Sandy at this point uh, on October 29th this year. And when Hurricane Sandy hit, it was the worst natural disaster we've ever faced in New York City. 44 lives were lost, $19 billion in damages and lost economic activity. It was devastating. Our subways were out for weeks because they were flooded with seawater. We're still repairing tunnels across the city because of that. Uh, we lost thousands of homes. We're still in the process of elevating and rebuilding and acquiring homes all across the city. Um, that just to, to talk about the enormity of what Sandy was uh, um, is almost hard if you didn't go through it, which is probably common in many disasters. And yet, something changed at that moment where we said, we're going to broaden our scope on how we're going to respond to this. We knew there was going to be a lot of federal, like big federal dollars coming into the region. We wanted to guide how that was happening. We took some early steps and said, let's widen our aperture here on the kinds of risks we face and took a much bigger view of the risks of climate change. And so understanding that, yes, we might have more coastal storms. We're going to have sea level rise. We're going to have more heat. We're going to have heat waves. We're going to have more rain and cloud bursts. And we put together a, a massive $20 billion program to address those risks. Um, that was happening over the last several years, and then we hit a break point about 18 months after that storm hit where the de Blasio administration came into office with a new focus on equity and really bridging the economic divide in New York City and addressing our inequality crisis and needed to start thinking about strategic planning for all that. And so the, the Sandy piece is happening and we're broadening our view on climate change and we're investing, and at the same time we have to think about we have a new administration in that we need to do some serious strategic thinking about the threats that we face as a city. And so we were building, of course, on at least a, a near-term legacy of um, some good strategic planning in, in New York City through our Plan YC process that Mayor Bloomberg had initiated in 2007, thinking about some wide-ranging themes of population growth and infrastructure. And even in the, in the first couple of months of the administration, we had been starting to put out plans on housing and workforce development, and we had instituted a, a municipal ID program, IDNYC, to bring more New Yorkers into the services that we provide as a city. A number of things were happening. But our partnership with 100 Resilient Cities started right around that moment when we were thinking about we need to develop a strategic plan for the, the threats that face us and for what we want to do as an administration. And so this partnership became a grounding uh, place for us to have this strategic conversation, to think about our city's resilience and what sort of city we want to build over the next several decades. So we immediately started talking to New Yorkers. And we went out 
phone polling. We did community board meetings, elected official engagement, the whole thing where we were out talking to thousands and thousands of New Yorkers to talk about what's important to you, what's interesting in your community, what's a threat in your community, what are the challenges that you face as a New Yorker uh, in your day-to-day -day life. We also engaged every single city agency in this process of developing our resilience strategy. 70 agencies came to the table, some with pre-baked plans that were great, some that saw an opportunity to develop some brand new thinking and to bring it into a structure. And all of that really coalesced for us into a, a few major challenges that really helped define how we wanted to move forward and the, and the types of things we wanted to put forward to build a more resilient city. But let me, let me walk through these challenges that we, that we came upon. One is we are a continuing to be a growing city. We are at Eight, uh, when we released our plan, we had 8.4 million New Yorkers. And we're projecting that by 2040, we were going to have 9 million New Yorkers in New York City. And you can imagine that's a lot of great things come with growth, right? The economic activity and the construction and just having more uh, vibrancy and more people. But it also comes with lots of strains that you need to invest in more housing. You need to make sure you have affordable housing. Transportation infrastructure needs to be upgraded. There need to be more jobs. There needs to be more opportunity for everybody to make that work. It's a, it's a, a major theme and a major challenge that came across. We also have a, a, uh, an aging infrastructure crisis in New York City. And so th and this chart is actually dual edged here. So on the one hand, most of our infrastructure was built over several hundred years. Our subways were 100 years old. Uh, we continue to have, you know, our average age of a water main in New York City is something like 86 years old. So there's a, a continuing need to maintain and upgrade, and, and you can almost never get in front of that. At the same time, we canvassed all of the spending that was going to happen in New York City from the city itself, from the state, from the federal government, the private institutions like hospitals and universities. We looked at um, what the big corporates are going to be spending on things that were generally infrastructure related, the utilities, and saw that over the next 10 years, we were expecting almost a quarter of a trillion dollars to be spent on infrastructure in New York City. Now, that's fantastic, right? Not many people can lay claim to a number like that. But on the one hand, if it's spent well, it will be great. And if it's coordinated and if it's planned, you can imagine how difficult that is. The, the flip side is if it's not coordinated, it's not planned, then you can have chaos and you can actually institutionalize more and more problems that you have in your city. And so we needed to think about this holistically. This one always strikes me. Whenever I, when I first saw this statistic, that 45.1% of New Yorkers were living at or near the poverty line, um, you almost can't imagine that when you think of New York City as the global capital center of the world, and yet it is an absolute reality for many of our residents um, that are struggling to deal with an unaffordable city. And so the challenges of income inequality and inequality broadly, we're, are, we're starting to tear at our city and really pull ourselves apart major challenge for our city. And then the last one, which is, of course, was bringing back to that lesson of Hurricane Sandy and this need to think about how climate change is going to affect us and um, the types of storms that we've seen just in the last two weeks, what we saw in Sandy, we know that climate change is making them worse. We know that climate change is uh, building on already risen sea levels. We've seen a foot of sea level rise in New York City in the last 100 years. We're projecting that that may be as much as two and a half feet more in, uh, by the 2050s, that those stresses of climate change, of sea level rise, of increased storms, of increased heat waves, are also going to put a massive stress on our infrastructure, on our population, on our ability to grow, and yes, on our most vulnerable New Yorkers. And so all of that together became the, the sort of the rallying cries for us, thinking about the, what we needed to do as a city and how we needed to build the city, the New York City of the future. And so uh, a little over two years ago at this point, we released our plan, our resilient strategy. It was the first resilient strategy in the network to be released. Um, one, uh, one New York, the plan for a strong and just city, or what we shorten as 1NYC. And it was released at a, at a key sort of uh, moment in time that we were also releasing our 10-year capital plan. So we were directing our spending, which was aligned with the plan. But at the end of that 10-year capital plan, we were, uh, we, were hitting a mile, we were going to hit a milestone in 2025 of the 400th anniversary of New York City. So the things that we do now are really helping define what the fifth century of New York City looks like. And so we, we recognize that historic moment. And the decisions we're making now are really going to help continue 
to build the future in New York City and, and making sure that our plan commits to the goals and initiatives to get that done. And the plan itself fits across four major themes. Yes, we're a growing city, and with that meant that we needed to make some big commitments on job growth, on transit uh, infrastructure investments, uh, we, and we've since made billions of dollars of investment in our, in our, uh, in our transportation network um, and in affordable housing. And so in our growing city and the theme of that vision is really about how do we manage growth in a smart way to, to make sure that we're connecting job growth and housing and transit in a way that reduces commute times and, and improves quality of life. And at, as at the same time we're growing, we want to make sure we're growing in a way that benefits all of New Yorkers and that uh, we became the first city, uh, I believe, to ever put a number on the desire to reduce poverty. And we said over the next 10 years, we want to, we want to lift 800,000 New Yorkers out of poverty. And that's through a number of mechanisms that largely are around affordability of housing and income growth, uh, in, 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 and most importantly, increasing the minimum wage. <coughs> um, and at the same time, our climate action efforts of sustainability and resilience, making sure that we are preparing uh, to cut and drastically cut our greenhouse gas emissions. We made a commitment to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions 80% by 2050. Uh, we, want to, we want to have cleaner air, cleaner water uh, in New York City. And we want to be ready for the, the shocks and stresses that are coming from climate change. So all of this really fits into the, the themes of 1NYC. And of course, we've been at this for uh, a little over two and a half years. And we have, the, uh, we have the pleasure of having a local law that says we have, to, we have to report on our progress every year. And so every April, we're releasing a progress report. And the most recent, uh, 2016, and we're, we're, we've since done the 2017, we, we have um, hit some major milestones on the delivery of this program. And having that plan and making major commitments that, are, that have initiatives, that have metrics, have an ability to track them, really promote accountability to delivering on them. And we've financed over 60,000 affordable units on, on the way to 200,000 over 10 years. We are at a record high number of jobs in New York City in our history. Um, and at the same time, we've, we were successful in fighting for that change to the minimum wage to lift New Yorkers out of poverty. And of that 800,000 New Yorkers target over 10 years, we can credibly say that we've helped lift 280,000 New Yorkers out of poverty with those measures alone. And down this list, we, the, we continue to see that the value of setting targets, holding ourselves accountable, and, we, and, it, and it mobilizes the government to deliver results as we continue to move forward. And I wanted to highlight just a couple of interesting uh, key projects um, that have come out of the program. And one, that, three projects that really help define the, the resilience dividend for us in New York City. Uh, one is the, the Rockaway Boardwalk. This was a, a boardwalk that was um, a largely wooden structure that was damaged and destroyed in New York City during Hurricane Sandy. We've since, and with federal help, we've replaced the boardwalk. Um, great, but that wouldn't have been uh, alone enough we made sure that we built it with better, stronger materials. We elevated it out of the floodplain, and we integrated it into our coastal protections on the Rockaways that really did not exist before uh, Hurricane Sandy. So now we have a five and a half mile, uh, day in, day out amenity for the 100,000 residents of the Rockaway Peninsula. At the same time, when it's needed to be a protective structure, it is helping protect them against floods um, of the kind that Hurricane Sandy threw at us. Um, marrying those two ideas together, that we can invest in protective infrastructure and at the same time improve our communities, became really important to us. Another one was really widening the lens on, on the risk we faced, as I mentioned. And we've, um, just in the last several months, uh, put forward an over $100 million heat mitigation program, because we know heat kills more New Yorkers than any other natural hazard every year. And by targeting and using data to identify the most heat vulnerable neighborhoods, we've been able to um, systematically plant trees, coat roofs, install green infrastructure, all programs that were happening, but we've been targeting them in the most heat vulnerable neighborhoods that have the most heat vulnerable residents. Um, incredibly important for us. It improves quality of life. It deals with stormwater, but also helps protect against those heat deaths. And the last example is, is an example of how we're institutionalizing resilience in New York City. And all the lessons and all the projects that we've been developing after Hurricane Sandy have come into guidance so that we can bring all those lessons learned 
into our entire capital program. We have got to stop thinking about projects as I'm going to do a resiliency project or a resilience project here, um, but I've got all my other projects over here. We need to be continuing to bring resilience as a lens into everything we do. Every time we make a capital investment decision in a road, in a drainage network, in any, in a school, we have to be able to um, bring those lessons to bear to make sure that we are continuing, continually bringing up our um, our investments to build a better and more resilient city. So I was just hoping to, to give a, a, hopefully this was brief, um, a little overview of the kinds of things we're thinking about in New York City and, and how the partnership with 100 Resilient Cities has, has enabled us to achieve these resilience dividends. Um, and I'll be happy to turn it over to Louise at this point. So thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Yeah, we should say hi. Um, actually, my name is uh, Louise Bradet, as you see in the front. I'm the Chief Resilient Officer, but I have to explain that I have several roles in the City of Montreal. I'm also the Emergency Manager Officer, and I'm also in charge of the business continuity. Now, if you all react that, look at me and say it's a lot, it's, not, it's then that I realize that it's a lot, so just... Uh, <laughs> Um, and I'm just going to take a step back to explain where we come from and why we jumped into this initiative. Um, and that's going to give you an idea of what we're doing this. Everybody remembers, I think, the uh, 1998 ice storm. Uh, that's when we realized that was, there was not really a system of coordination into the province. And uh, we failed in many ways into communication. So after that, there was uh, a lot directed to um, implemented to develop for the municipality to develop a better knowledge of their risk, to implement uh, um, uh, plan response, and to establish forecasting and advance warning system. Till now, there's only 30% uh, of the cities in Quebec that have this kind of plan and this kind of system in place. That's when we created, there was an emergency office, but that's when we created uh, the Civil Security Center and uh, that I took uh, office uh, in uh, 2009. So that's the lessons we learned then. Everybody, I think, heard about the Lac Mégantic incident. Uh, sadly, uh, it occurs 250 uh, kilometers from Montreal. 47 people died, and that's when we realized that our cities had railways, and it was a risk, um, but we also needed for the economy uh, survival or, or the economy uh, of our cities. Um, suddenly, people were asking us, what are you doing on the emergency management plan? And that's why we started to say it's not an emergency response that we need. Uh, it's more into are we going to take the existing developing of the city around the railways, use, uh, uh, I'm sorry, about, and use mitigation uh, things about the railways in order to prevent this kind. But it's not, it's not just an emergency response. We have to think, take things differently. So with all the thinking and all the lessons we learned from these events, that's why we see the opportunity in 2013, my office uh, applied uh, with uh, the general manager office into the 100 resilient city challenge and we got into the second phase after the first application, we, got, uh, we became a resilient, a resilient city. Not, no, actually, no. And I, actually, I didn't really, when I react to this, it was not about saying that we're resilient, it's about the tattoo they react. I you said every CRO got a tattoo. That's how I react. Um, so in January 216, then we had the workshop. We brought all together uh, 100 stakeholders and to discuss what should be, what was the vision. And also, of course, because I'm the emergency manager, everybody that was around the table had a perspective and a limited definition of uh, resilience uh, from the emergency management point of view. And that's how we become to enlarge uh, the conversation, I would say. And then um, we, create the, we created the resilience office. For us, it's not 
uh, something that we just want to develop. It, it can, in, for any city, it, can, it cannot be something that you develop just over a partnership, a great partnership uh, for two years. It's something that you have to institutionalize if you want it to keep, uh, to, to, to stay in your city. So we created the office. We took uh, the grant from the, uh, the 100 RC. I'm already a permanent in the cities, and we are two people to accompany me and to the development of the strategy. So of course, our mandate is to better prepare Montrealers in the city to cope with just urbans, integrate resilient thinking. But I, I would say it's, um, it's not about a paper. It's not about a strategy. It's about how we can make things change. So my team at the Civil Protection Office will take care of all the shocks you see there. They have planned to, to, uh, to face that. Um, what, we're, uh, what we will, and it's look a lot, a lot like uh, you, things you, should, uh, you could uh, face in Toronto, natural shocks like floods, extreme weather events, and earthquake. And actually, it's something that most citizens in Montreal don't even know that they are on uh, earthquake uh, area, that it's a risk in our area. Technological, industrial risk, uh, transportation of hazardous good, material incident, and critical infrastructure, biological virus pandemic, social terrorism. So we, we are prepared with plans, but we realize and we collaborate with a, a large uh, amount of uh, people to get prepared for that. But realize that there was not enough people around the table. We need to bring the urban development we need to bring the health uh, department, one of the people that we prepared a plan for with us, but in order to uh, mitigate the impact on the society, we need, um, we need all levels of, of government around us in, in, uh, in the conversation. And it's the development of, of, a, of the strategy is helping us doing that. So in June, it's September 216, we had four, uh, with the results we got from the first, uh, the, the first uh, workshop, we created four stakeholder committees about diversity and social equity, uh, urban infrastructure and public utilities, prosperity and innovation, and quality of living and river, in order to go deeper into the conversation and kind of step back from uh, the conversation just on the uh, emergency management way, point of view. We also engage conversation with our citizens uh, we uh, add a survey, uh, and usually when we put a survey online and we, we try to, to have a feedback, people, we will have about 400, 500 answers. Uh, just remember that Montreal is 1.9 million. This time we got 100, 1,600. This was a great, great success. But we realized that it was a communication, <coughs> a communication and education challenge also. So people will misunderstand uh, resilience. Actually, we got some uh, um, people were uh, looking more on to the uh, psychological uh, de uh, definition of it, but realized that uh, they were misunderstanding resilience for resignation. And we, we had to engage conversation with them and explain, and which were, that was an opportunity to talk with them, actually, we engage conversation um, and uh, explain what was urban residents and what we were looking to do and what did, what they could do in the, in the same way. Uh, so in September, uh, through, through the summer, we, uh, we did the validation of work by a steering committee, which it's uh, like a top of the stakeholders, uh, directors from the city, but most importantly from inside the city, which they are, I would say, criticizing. Anyway, they're giving feedback <laughs> on the work. Um, and we do that all summer. And, but most importantly, we sit back with everybody to be sure that we had common interest and to build on it. So we, didn't, we just didn't want people just to say, I'll be a part of this, but not really getting, getting engaged and not having real action into place. So we sit with everybody one by one, me and my, uh, the two girls that are working with me on the strategy, just to be sure that we uh, really connect on something and it will have real, real results. So this fall, we are, we are de developing the, the action plan. And I, sh I know that Elliot is like, really wants to have my strategy and my action plans. It's at the end, but in French, there's a trick. <laughs> so he's gonna have to do some effort. Um, 
because we are at the point where I, I, we need to show results and we need to, to uh, show real uh, concrete possibilities of what uh, it could give. And during, during uh, all the development, we also had another event, uh, which you, I think, believe uh, just ended a few weeks or a few months, for a few months ago here. We had the flooding. And while all this conversation that took place during the year and a half or so uh, that I'm in place as the CRO, all the work, it's the first time that I, now I realized that, okay, this is showing results. So while I was doing the coordination of the event, I had uh, to, put pla to put in place the establishment phase, and I'd contact spontaneously the economic development called me and say, okay, this is not a municipal responsibility, but we want to, new to put a new program and everything we've, this we've been discussing in the last few weeks. We want to try a program to help the really local uh, people and make sure that the little business are surviving. And that was, I was really tired. Like I put like a month into a month of work and just receiving that call and say, okay, this is working. And this, is, this could work on the long term, and that's why we're doing this. So I had, uh, we put that in place, and it's going to be something that's going to stay in the, strategic, uh, uh, in the strategy at the end. It, that's something that's going to be stay in the city for the future. So also when I, I went to see the mayor uh, at the end of the event just to make uh, my report, he said, Luis, just be sure. Actually, he doesn't call me Louise anymore. He calls me, he calls me Resilience. I used to be Louise. <laughs> he introduced me as Resilience. Uh, I guess it's about the three jobs, uh, I, I believe. Um, he said, Louise, just be sure that while we're doing the thinking about the strategy, just be sure that your report is going to be a Resilience one. That does not just be about the operation and the usual uh, suspects, I will say, that people really... Uh, see uh, that we show them that we are moving and that we are changing things. It must be because I was tired, but I had uh, a tear coming up when he told me that. So the, the, the lessons we are learning and we learn, it's, uh, and that's why I tried to step back and show you all these events. It's you have, as a CRO, uh, you have to be, take advantage of all the opportunities. Sadly, it becomes, again, with an event, but you have to show when something happened that things could be, uh, could be uh, done differently in order that one day you, we're gonna have enough mitigation action in place that we don't, we just, I'm sorry, uh, my English can be chaotic. Just buckle up because it's gonna make sense by the end. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just to make sure that we just uh, won't be facing event anymore that we could prevent and reduce really all together and not just with the fire and the, the, the police department, but just with as a city, a whole city. You have, again, to have a large and inclusive stakeholder engagement. It might, it might be, it's you are guys in a rough place, actually, because you have to engage people, but you don't, you have an ID, but you don't really know where you're gonna land, but you have to engage them. But this conversation you are having are really important, and the connection point you are you're gonna you know you're gonna create and then the share interest, uh, uh, it's the main thing about this thing. And I'm sorry if I say it's the strategy is the paper. It's how what you develop. It's really important, but still, it's a paper. It's what you're gonna develop while doing it. You need to, of course, engage everybody into the city, but it has to be unresolved and transversal. And we learn, also learn the strength on the 100RC network. Every city have different experience, share experience, and it's great to be able to call any of the CROs and be able to learn from them. And actually, I might gonna get back to that at the end, but there's something coming up with the, the Canadian cities. Calgary and Vancouver are also a part of the network. We talk, if it's not the CROs, the team are talking twice a month, and it's a, a high uh, capacity uh, something we could develop, I believe, with that team. So again, we built uh, the challenge and opportunities we had along the way. We built from, it's not about just the emergency management, but still we were, uh, we were uh, working into a collaborative uh, way of, 
that's why we, how we were developing our plans. It was a great opportunity to just leverage on that. And if you have this kind of collaboration, of this kind of committee already in place, it's not about redoing things. It's about recognizing what's already in place and build on it again. Um, I have the business, I told you I have the business continuity opportunity. One stakeholder that was really hard to bring around the table in Montreal, it could be totally different in Toronto, I'm sure it's totally different in, in New York, it was the economic, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the businesses, it was really hard to bring them around the table, so I had to find a way to. But I realized that they were not well prepared, that they will, uh, and they had an interest about knowing the risks and how to prepare, and that I know. So uh, I'm going to take my team, my civil protection team, my business continuity. I'm going to meet their need to be well prepared, and I'm going to create links with them and have them around the table. Uh, again, there's thousands. I, I keep saying, like, initiatives are popping up in Montreal right now. So it's crazy. Like, I turn around, and it's something. Uh, so we, we have... So we need to have a, better, uh, have a better overview and create a better overview, but we need to create a common ground, uh, ground to work on. So we're going to work with the, people, with the people from the Climate Change Adaptation Plan that was, was just released. They have a thousand actions, so they need help. Uh, maybe they need less action, but we, and we got, so could we create a common interest and going to help them. We, I'm going to work with the sustainable team uh, to, there's a lot, again, of initiative in the city, a lot of administrative working on this initiative. So we're going to try to link all these programs and make them work locally and see how it works instead to all works in silos. I hate to see silos, but now I, I cannot find a, a better word. It's overused, but still. Um, Elias, I'm gonna talk to you about this. Identifying internal allies in opponents. You have to, some people will just see you as a trap. That's what I'm looking at you. <laughs> Not you, but some people will say, okay, what's this new thing? They want to take my job, or they, we don't want to take your job. We want, we want to change the way we do things. We're going to show you how we can better work together. Uh, so, but you, you have, in order to, to make this work, you have to identify them. Integration of the academic community, scientific evidence. And I think many of you would like that. Uh, as the emergency manager and trying to make things evolve, I realized that the first thing when uh, we need to, but with the budget cuts and the size down and all that, was it the first thing we cut? Prevention, planification. It's always the same thing. Maybe now with the events coming, it won't happen that fast, but it's still the first thing we cut. So I asked many universities in Montreal to follow the work we're doing the intention we have to keep a memory of this in order to, I hope, not repeat this, the things in the future, but also to have scientific evidence of what we're doing. This is uh, my friend's slide. Here we go. You can translate. <laughs> but I have, uh, since I cannot read it, speak in French, can my, my brain is already going <laughs> to translate. Um, the idea we have, so that's the main action we're going to put in place, and already we have the, the action plan behind that. But the idea is to build from the community and hop. I've been convinced for many years that the citizens are, it's a shared responsibilities, and the citizens have to be a part and heart of what we're doing. But in order to do so, we have to connect better with them. I don't have a solution. I'm just saying that's the intention. We have many things in place, but we have to prove that. If we want them to be well prepared, then we have to talk more about our risk and what's around them. So they have to be around. And also, we need to develop um, a better in Montreal, uh, um, community cohesion. Uh, but if it, it's, not, it's not something that can be done by the city, maybe we can assist them. And if something works pretty really good in one place, why can we not duplicate them? That's, I think that's something a city should do. Second, it's, uh, it's protect our, our, our milieu, uh, milieu de vie living environment uh, with the grays and the, the, the green infrastructure. I've been talking about that all afternoon. Okay, and uh, the, the third one is taking action to maintain or di di diversify the innovative economy. That's, that's what I've been talking with, uh, what we would want to do with the economic uh, sector. 
And also, at the end, it's uh, taking action to build an integrated governance of resilience that will best serve the, civ the Montreal community. It's about uh, a shared responsibility. And actually, I just uh, won a little battle in my city that I've been fighting for for eight years. Um, it's to give, uh, officially give the responsibility to all the manager and all the department in the city of Montreal of the resilience and of the preparedness. Uh, it might sound silly, but it's a, it's a, it's a big win, and now everybody will have to uh, show some results about these things. So what's coming up? Am I taking too long? What's coming up with the action plan is develop and strategies should be released by the end of the year, Mrs. Stinson. And we are jumping into implementation, implement but, but again, uh, yes, it's a, it's a strategy, but we already put things in action to really have uh, some changes. And what you see here, it's a real picture that we took during the flooding uh, we had in May. You see that the flowers are blooming even though it's flooding, and I think that's a real proof of resilience. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, thanks everybody for coming. Um, thank you Otis, Dan, and Louise for traveling to be with us here today. I also wanna thank uh, Olivia, Anna Maria, and Stuart who are here who are part of our resilience team who helped pull this together. And uh, Enid, uh, Selena, and everyone else on IMFG for, for putting this on. Uh, I wanna start today with a story. And it's a story about a hurricane. And this isn't Irma or something else, right? This, these are pictures from Toronto of Hurricane Hazel, which hit in 1954, killed more than 80 people and caused hundreds of millions of dollars of damage. Um, you can see here, you know, roads, infrastructure, houses uh, inundated. And it was in response to that that we created the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority. And Toronto and Region part of that is really important. You see in the blue sort of dotted lines there, that's basically an outline of Toronto. And we sit within a watershed which extends beyond our borders, like uh, the Mimico, Don Valley, Etobicoke Rivers. They, you know, we have to coordinate with our neighbors. TRCA was created because the individual municipalities were not the right size for managing river flooding. Uh, and I have a little quote there that I like from their website about interaction with nature, but I learned something recently. It's that the Conservation Authority system actually wasn't created in response to Hurricane Hazel. It was created nearly 10 years before. And for that decade, a bunch of environmentalists were agitating for flood protection. Um, all of those measures were uh, rejected, essentially. And it wasn't until after Hurricane Hazel that we amalgamated those bodies together, gave them some real power, did things like expropriate land, and didn't build back in floodplains. And so I, I take a couple of things from this that I want us to keep in mind. The first is that we can actually reform the way that we govern our environment with nature. We can do it here. Uh, the second is that obviously in the past we have um, ignored that fact and made those changes after the storm. And the third is just, as you've seen from the other presentations that we've had here today, we have an opportunity to move now ahead of the storm, whatever the storm may be. And so just to put in context, you've heard from New York, who are two years on, heard from Montreal, who are at about the strategy development phase. We're at this infancy, this preliminary resilience phase. And I want to uh, share with you four or five of the tools that we've been uh, kind of looking at, um, some of the results, and then maybe look a bit ahead, right? So the first thing that we've been doing is speaking with a lot of people. These numbers pale in comparison to uh, Montreal and New York, but we're just getting started. Hundreds of people, all the divisions, uh, sorry, all the clusters at City Hall, most of the divisions, uh, other orders of government, such as our colleagues at the province, some of whom are here today, um, other cities, and of course, we've learned tons from the network. One of the things that we got from the network um, is this. We do something called jurisdictional scanning in public policy. That's looking at what other jurisdictions are doing, right? And uh, I stole this data from Sydney that basically ranked 33 world economies. And they said, okay, there are seven of them that because of their economic might and regional influence are in the top table. London, New York, Paris, et cetera. We're gonna put those aside. And then they said, this is not Toronto, right? Sydney said that we are in the top contenders, right? 10 cities that are contending for um, that top table. And I found this group, particularly our Anglophone colleagues plus uh, Amsterdam, as a useful sort of comparison group uh, as we went through things. And the first thing that has to be said amongst that group, we're doing great. We are awesome. Uh, the quality of life here in particular, this is one of the best places to live in the world. That's why uh, I moved back here. But Toronto is changing. With the exception of the greater Sydney area, the greater Toronto area is the fastest growing population center of its kind in the world. 
Um, this is the greater area, okay? Let's zoom in on Toronto for a second, the city. What you see here are the high-rise buildings. Those are buildings like, uh, you know, 150 meters above, proposed, approved, or under construction in Toronto versus our peers, okay? It's astonishing, right? This doesn't even include things like um, Waterfront Toronto, the Bentway, Rail Deck, Transit City. What we're doing here in terms of the scale uh, of changes to our built environment is actually, it's unique, right? What's happening here is unique. And it's happening everywhere, right? This is a slide which shows uh, uh, basically new projects and other things around the city. It's happening everywhere. It's particularly happening downtown. Uh, and we're really looking forward to the work coming out of city planning, uh, led by the outgoing chief planner, Jennifer Kiesmat, on a new plan for the downtown core because it is intensifying so rapidly. We also know that the climate is changing. Uh, this data is a bit, it's a bit dated. It's from the city of Toronto 2011, but it's still relevant. It shows basically we're getting hotter, we're getting wetter, and we're getting wilder, right? And by wilder, we mean a greater intensity and frequency of extreme events. So you probably know all of that already. Let's combine those two trends for a second, urbanization uh, and climate change. What you see here um, is uh, rain, basically the three light blue lines are rain gauges and the dark one is our design standard. This is rainfall um, within one day. So we are designing to a rainfall standard of about 27 millimeters or something like that uh, per day. And this is what we had uh, in May 2000, August 2005, and July 2013. And I, I put this up here not to say that we should change all the design codes right away, uh, although that there is some work uh, going on federally and provincially uh, on that. But the question is, you know, is it more expensive to, to change the design codes or to suffer the flooding, right? And it's a really important question because of the magnitude of the city building that's going on. And I, I've cherry picked this example from flooding, but it could be zoning, it could be our capital projects, uh, it could be the city services we deliver. And you know, I think this is really, it's a, it's a central question. Is the city that we're building appropriate for the city that we're gonna live in, for the environment that we're gonna live in? And I'm just gonna show one example of a city where I think you know, we can all recognize that it wasn't done as well as it could. Obviously these are pictures from Houston. Um, you know, people building in floodplains, um, uh, zoning permits not in compliance, uh, paving over wetlands. Uh, this, I think we all know, it's in the news a lot. And the, the key thing is to think about, you know, what's the impact on vulnerable groups, right? Because we know that vulnerable, vulnerable groups suffer worse in shocks and they bounce back more slowly. Um, and so the, these are the sorts of things that we need to keep in mind um, when we are reviewing uh, our standards. Just coming back to Toronto, another one of the tools that 100RC has helped us with is called a vulnerability and risk assessment. We're building on work with our colleagues at the province to identify um, some of the threats to the city, things like cyber, uh, CBRNE stands for chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, or explosive failure or attack. These are big issues. Um, we're looking at things like energy supply, right? Particularly as we electrify, when we electrify things like cars, we're concentrating our energy supply into one system. Are there vulnerabilities there? We've heard things like, uh, is Toronto food secure? Um, are we gonna have a big uh, migration uh, incident such as from our neighbors from the south? Uh, we got a couple who we hope are gonna just stay here with us today. But uh, bottom line is we're, we're doing a, a, a vulnerability assessment built off of work already done uh, by our colleagues at the city. Another tool that 100RC provides us which has been really helpful has been the perceptions uh, tool. Don't worry about the detail, you can't read it anyway. But what we're hearing, okay, the first two I wasn't surprised with, right? How many conversations do you have in the city where people talk about real estate? Huh? And how many times do people want to talk about traffic or congestion or the Scarborough subway? So the fact that people are stressing about housing and transportation is of no surprise. I was a bit surprised to see city governance listed there. It may be because of the first few hundred people we've spoken to, they're people who really understand city government. Um, but let, let's come back to that in a moment. Look, this is not a surprise to anyone. We are experiencing a decreasing housing affordability. You see some of our peers there. This is not uncommon, right? It, not to say it isn't a problem, but it, it's not uncommon. I wonder a bit that, you know, whether it would have been as extreme in our stakeholder perceptions if we took them in August as opposed to June because of, of current events in the news. But look, this has to be said. We're experiencing decreasing housing affordability. We are also increasing, uh, experiencing increase in congestion. Um, this is a fact of life in Toronto. I don't think this requires all too much explanation. This to me is really what's important. And what you're seeing here is research from, uh, from U of T, from David Holchansky. Many of you will be familiar with these images. 
On the far left, you see 1970, 1980, 1990, and 2012. The yellow or yellowy bits are census tracts of middle income, red are census tracts of low income, and blue are census tracts of high income. And what you see over time is that congestion and housing affordability together are fueling a long-term trend in inequality in the city, where the middle class uh, is almost non-existent on that map, and we are becoming a city of haves and have-nots. This is a major issue, right? It's a major stress in and of itself. It's also a major issue for our shocks, because as I said before, we know that vulnerable groups do worse and bounce back more slowly. Here are a couple selected stakeholder perceptions on city governance that I'll just, you can read them faster than I can. Right, and you know what we're seeing here is basically that people, I guess a lot of these are insiders, but people nonetheless are, are pretty pessimistic and they're pessimistic for a reason, okay? Um, the city budget is strained. We have a lot of aspirational goals and strategies and things that we know we need to do, but we don't necessarily have the resources mobilized to do it. Um, I'm not gonna speak about this in great detail because a, a wonderful, brilliant, amazing person who also happens to be my boss is gonna be speaking here in five weeks, Peter Wallace, uh, on this topic at the annual IMFG event. And, and while we're here, I wanna recognize the contribution that this institution has made to the public policy debate about like, why can't we have nice things, right? We have all these nice strategies, but we can't pay for them. One of the things that I've really taken away diving into IMFG's work over the last 10 years um, has been this idea that Toronto is too big yet too small, right? The city of Toronto, as it was created in 1998, for example, is not big enough to address the watershed issues. That's why we still have TRCA, which I mentioned earlier, as a separate institution. In some ways, we're too big because in that development planning review I showed earlier, we break down development into four areas in the city. Transportation services also breaks down into areas in the city. So there's a tension um, that we experience there, and I think we need to keep that in mind. I know we're moving quickly, but you know this is kind of the, the picture that we're painting, right? We have some stresses, we have some shocks. Very purposefully in the middle of that um, is climate change adaptation, right? It feeds into our shocks, it feeds into our stresses. And if I were to change this um, sort of very homemade chart uh, into a sentence, I would say that our resilience challenge is that in the context of a rapidly urbanizing city, a changing climate, and a connected global economy, how do we enable inclusive and climate resilient growth? That to me is our big, uh, big thing. Now, in terms of what we're actually gonna do, we're not there yet, okay? But I'm gonna share a couple of the early ideas. I think first we have to say, this is the art of the possible. We have significant ambitions uh, and the city budget is large. We have lots of staff, we're gonna move on this stuff. But in terms of what we're gonna do from a resilience perspective that is new, we need to balance that down against things like, what do we actually govern? Because the city may not govern those things. What resources do we have? Um, and what's already going on? Because this is a, a, a pretty wild policy context. And again, 100RC has helped us with this, um, with what's called an actions inventory. This is a bit of a homemade graphic also, but it just shows there's a lot going on, right? Even at the top line, you have things like the poverty reduction strategy, the official plan, the long-term fiscal plan. Uh, and each, in each area, you have just a lot of work that's already happening. I wanna point out, for example, we have a new chief transformation officer who started the same time as I, who's helping to modernize the city system. You have the Civic Innovation Office, which launched on Tuesday, uh, which again is another approach uh, at modernizing government. One of the things that I've found in this actions inventory, which is interesting, is that um, we have a bit of a gap under the climate change um, area. We have Transform TO, which is Toronto's mitigation plan. And there are several co-benefits in that space for adaptation. Uh, certainly, they took a co-benefits approach, but fundamentally, mitigation is mitigating our impact on the environment, and adaptation is about how the environment impacts us. Any work that we do in adaptation needs to mesh, obviously, with Transform TO. It was unanimously approved by council. It is our uh, mitigation plan, but compared to our peer cities, we really don't have the same building box in place. So what I've done here is just taken the known activities. I'm not saying that Sydney or Washington aren't doing enough, but looking at what other cities are doing, we know that they're doing certain things like neighborhood level adaptation planning, uh, citywide planning, and so on. And I'm just, in the next few slides, gonna talk a little bit about, about what that might mean for us if we did those things. The first thing is mainstreaming. And mainstreaming probably sounds like a bit of a 
policy wonk term, but it's a real thing. Um, it really is what enables us to apply a resilience lens into the city divisions and departments. So I've put up here, you, you know, the, the planning cycle for an asset, right? You plan, you design, you pay for it, you procure it, then you deliver it and you evaluate. And just, you know, very quickly with, with uh, my colleagues at the city, you know, it was pretty easy for us to plug in a few ideas of where we could immediately, you know, integrate into mainstream, I should say, into land use planning, into standards, into procurement or into evaluation. So this is mainstreaming, it's a real thing, and I think we should do it. Neighborhood level resilience. This is a chart also from U of T, from the Center for the Resilience of Critical Infrastructure, I think is what that stands for, um, from, from Alexander Haight. Basically, um, without going into too much detail, you go along your normal life, then an incident happens, you drop to the bottom, and there are three steps, reaction, response, and recovery. And when it comes to reaction, we know that in a large scale event, the public service can't be everywhere at once. That's just not going to happen. Um, neighborhoods and businesses are the first line of defense. And again, as we know, we need to focus on the vulnerable neighborhoods because they're the ones who do the worst in, worst in shocks and they recover more slowly. The nice thing about neighborhood resilience is also just it's a good thing to do day to day addressing the stresses of the city. I'm going to dive into one example in, in a bit of detail because I think it, it's required to really understand what neighborhood resilience means. In Toronto, we have 1,200 apartment towers that are made of concrete that were built before 1984, after 1945, that are higher than eight stories. That's a lot, right? It houses, by a sort of a rough count, about 600,000 people. And by my count, about a third of those are what we would define as vulnerable populations. And I want to just give a bit of contrast, right? The top picture is what you see an artist rendering from the Mervish Village redevelopment, that's at Bathurst and Bloor. And what you see are buildings that are close together, um, there's retail at grade, um, nature is integrated into the, um, into the building. And then what you see at the bottom are the apartment towers that we built a long time ago, um, which are far away from each other, right? Um, and you can't see it, but there is no retail at grade. And partly there's no retail grade because we zoned them such that they couldn't have it. We zoned them as residential and we mandated that they have a certain number of parking spaces even though the people living in these towers now may not uh, have cars. And there's been a recent change, it sounds like a really small thing, but it's called the Residential Apartment Commercial Zoning, uh, RAC Zoning, which I think is a huge deal for these communities because what it enables us to do is put non-residential uses like retail stores, community hubs in the buildings, and just think about like a blizzard, right? Or not even a blizzard because that's a big shock. Think about winter, um, <laughs> right? Or, or even a day like today that we have or if we have 44 degree days in summer. You know, if Mrs. Shaw in apartment 2411 it needs to get her prescription filled, where does she go, right? If we need a cooling center, where do we go? Um, if we need daycare, for example, we have to leave these towers. And I think this is a huge opportunity to work with the residents in those neighborhoods um, to create jobs in the neighborhoods such that the neighborhoods themselves can run, um, again, small-scale non-residential uses. So this is, a, I, I realize that's a bit of a detailed example, but I think it draws out what we mean by neighborhood resilience. Going back to, um, to uh, this clever chart, um, let's look at the recovery side, right? Um, we haven't had, uh, thankfully, um, you know, a hurricane like Hazel in, in 70 some odd years. Um, and so we don't really have that recovery capacity, like an office of recovery, like what New York has, right? Um, what we do have right now is, uh, I, I have to say it's a modest sized emergency for the city, right? It was flooding on the island and I say modest because in, within the context of the economy or the population, the island you know, isn't the biggest part of either one of those, but the island is symbolically important to us, right? People do live there and that matters, uh, and we care about it, right? The island is, is, is of major significance. We sat with um, the mayor uh, a couple of hours ago and you know, he was talking about the island. He was there this morning, it's, it's important. And this is a great test bed for us because it's a contained place. The city actually uh, owns the property, it's a park. So it's a great opportunity for us to apply resilience thinking in the context of recovery and start to build that capacity which we may need to deploy at another time. City level resilience plan. This is definitely something that we're gonna do. Um, I think we call it a resilience strategy. It, look, resilience requires a whole of government approach because we have to work across the city. But again, think back to the TRCA example, it requires a whole of government's approach, right? We have to work with the agencies, boards, and corporations. We have to work with our neighboring municipalities. For example, uh, Amazon, we want to bring them here. So suddenly we're going to work with our neighboring municipalities. Uh, and of course we have to work with the province, it's essential. 
And so this really enables us to apply resilience lens across uh, the spectrum of what we do. I really liked what LA's adaptation plan uh, did because they used climate change adaptation to look at housing, transportation, and equity, right? Which were the three stresses that we know that we have here. So I think there's a lot to learn from the network and, and, and from our peers. Just as I'm coming to the conclusion, I think, again, this is what is emerging, it, it, certainly in my head, uh, as our resilience challenge. It's about the massive opportunity that we have in growth, making sure that our growth is inclusive uh, and climate resilient. I have to admit, like I said, we're just getting started. We don't have all the answers, uh, and we need to hear more. We need to hear more from everybody here. Um, we, have, we have more people to speak with, so please participate in our survey. Connect with us online. And we have a number of upcoming events, including uh, at the Canadian uh, Urban Institute, which we will build uh, on the work that we've done here today. So let me just once again say thank you to our guests for coming and visiting us. We really, really appreciate it. We hope you come back and you stay longer. And thank you to Enid and the staff at IMFG for having us here today. So um, we wanted to open up uh, opportunity to uh, just answer a couple of a uh, couple of questions. Um, I'm going to uh, kind of pose the pose the first question and then open up opportunity for uh, anyone in the audience who may have some questions for the chief resilience officers that you uh, that you have here today or, or for myself. Um, so uh, first, I'm going to uh, hit uh, Dan and Louise if you don't mind. Um, each of your governments have taken a different approach at institutionalization uh, of this work that you, you talked about in your presentations, and thank you both for that. Um, in New York, it was through an extremely comprehensive kind of city planning process, and, and in Montreal, they, you know, kind of through, through the creation of the office. Can each of you talk a bit about how this has worked for you in terms of institutionalization of the work across city government, and particularly the silo busting um, that has been necessary for you to, to advance your work? Um, I believe the model we put in place in Montreal did, it did help because it was someone from within the city and someone from outside the city would have been seen differently. So again, as I explained in my uh, presentation, being able to count on the, um, the collaboration we has to establish before and all the partnership we had a count on that was really um, facilitating. Um, Although uh, we had to meet with a lot of uh, internal services and explain really our role, and again, um, be able to reassure them that it was not a question of coordinate, well, coordination, yes, but not taking their place, but working differently. Um, but I would say also, um, this model that we've put in place uh, for the implementation and uh, for the first phase, and we're already talking about it, uh, could not last in the future. So uh, it will have to, to change at, uh, at some point, and we are already talking about it and with general mm. manager. I think I missed something in the last part of your question, though. Well, so just how are you, um, uh, how is the way that you've been institutionalized, um, how has it, it enabled you to best kind of push through the work in the various departments? Well, uh, being, see, uh, again, be, uh, see, mm, sorry. Being a part of the city and a part of the thing is being really helpful and not being seen at be a, an outsider. As an other. Good. Dan? I've heard the job described in some ways as the chief silo buster for the city. <laughs> <clears throat> um, there, there's a couple of points, I guess, to make around how New York City has thought about institutionalizing this work. And um, you can imagine, I think, the, the point that Ellie made around that cities do lots of plans, and lots of plans sit on shelves and develop dust. The things that we did after this plan and when working with 100 Resilient Cities and with all the agencies and having top-down buy-in on what we were doing allowed us to put in place a couple things after the plan was released and continue a few things that we used in the development of the plan. Uh, one is a, a, an advisory board that was made up of about 40 different leaders from uh, different sectors of, uh, of the private sector, the public sector. Um, the different institutions uh, that make up New York City that sat on the board that helped us to, to, to develop the plan. And we've since, we, we meet with them generally maybe two or three times a year 
and engage them on <coughs> the different questions that we're still grappling with or the programs we're developing. And in some cases, they've organized um, on their own small subcommittees to explore a particular topic. And so there's, there's been a way to in institutionalize the engagement that we have with the uh, with our outside stakeholders, which is really helpful. We've kept in place something that we call our 1MYC Steering Committee, which is made up of the first deputy mayor and about six of us across the administration that on a regular basis are doing performance management tracking on how we're doing on delivering on the couple hundred initiatives that we've laid out over the, several, over the last couple of years as part of this program. And are we hitting our milestones? Are we hitting our targets? And it's regular engagement, so it's not just we developed a 10-year plan, okay, come see me in 10 years and we'll see if we got it done. We're actively doing performance management to track against milestones. We're monitoring the indicators that we've laid out to see are we going in the right direction, are we going in the wrong direction? Well, then we, let's see what we have to do to fix that. Um, and then in particular with the agencies, you know, we have about 70 different agencies across the city and all of them have their own mission. And we come to talk to them and it's that's you know we're not generally bringing something that's a mission fit for them but we need their help and we need agencies to work across agency lines in a lot of ways and in, in many ways that's, that's the function of many different mayor's offices across the city is to really bring together multiple agencies on a shared goal where you, you can't delegate the authority to one agency to get something done because it really is a, it's outside their mission fit and they get, need to have other partners so we can use that convening power of the mayor's office to bring people together and have the conversations and lay out the priorities of what the administration and the mayor wants to get done, and we can move there together. So all of that's been really helpful. And then the last point I really wanted to make is around the, the way that we approached this effort with 100 Resilient Cities was not, thanks for the check, we'll, we'll take somebody for two years and then you know we'll go on our way. We really found a way to redeploy existing teams. And in, in our case, it was our sustainability office, uh, our resiliency office that had formed after Hurricane Sandy, and portions of our mayor's office of operations that come together regularly and, and, and work on this effort, where you could probably point to about teams of you know nearly 100 different people that on a regular basis are thinking about things in terms of 1MYC because that's the mission of, uh, of what we have to do. It didn't mean we created 100 new positions out of thin air to develop our resilience strategy and to implement it. You know, we're a big city and we were able to think about priorities and let's merge the right teams together in order to move it forward because it was a priority to us. So there's a couple of different things to think about in terms of how we, how to approach the idea of institutionalization because it, it can't just be, you know, the one person who, whose job this is that knows all the history and then you know, God forbid you walk out the door and then it all falls apart. You got to find ways to build partners, to have, you know, godfathers across the different uh, agencies, people <laughs> who care about what you're doing um, and who are bought in, even if it's not their day to day. Well, part of building resilience is, uh, is really about trying to face some of the unpopular uh, challenges that, that uh, the, um, a difficult usually for a city to, to confront. Um, we have uh, uh, in the city of uh, Boston, uh, the their resilience strategy kind of uh, took on head on uh, some of the issues of uh, racial inequity um, with great courage and, and in a very kind of comprehensive way. In New York, in, in your strategy, um, you've You've uh, spoken boldly and bravely, I think, in terms of around equity issues um, in ways that uh, governments, city governments in the past, um, just shied away from because it's allergic to right yeah. um, hives and sneezing, <laughs> and, um, and uh, and so my next question is to is to our newest members is uh, to to the family. Um, is is just around uh, as you look at Toronto, and I mean. To not just saying it because I'm here, but it's an awesome city, right? Uh, you, the list of firsts is up there, uh, but there are also obviously some um, challenges that can be tough. Uh, what are the way? What are some of the ways you want to take on the work of those more difficult issues, um, and to elevate your challenges and create a sense of urgency and political will that will be needed to advance the work? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I think it's really early to think about what, you know, we would put, be putting the cart before the horse to say, 
this is what we're going to do. But there are definitely a couple of areas that we, um, you know, we can't avoid thinking about, right? We, I had a chance to flip through the first 100 um, responses to our survey. About 70 of them um, use the word diversity or inclusion or something like that as a major strength in the city. So I think we have to ask ourselves, you know, what is it about diversity as a strength um, is important to us? How do we foster that? Is, you know, are we doing anything to foster that? Does it just happen because we're Canadian and nice or something? Like, so I think that's, that's a core question. Um, and, and to be completely fair, my question is more about the, um, the how, you're thinking around the how as opposed to the what, right? Because it's, it's too early necessarily to yeah. pick the, the what, yeah. but just around the, the how. Yeah, so I think diversity is, is a key issue, right? Uh, how, I don't know what exactly we're gonna do. We have to, we have to ask the, the, the question. And as I said before, climate change adaptation is really core, core to the agenda here. I mean, flooding is the thing that's on everybody's mind when we did the announcement. Uh, that we were that we were starting this process, we did it at the island um, to emphasize, you know, that flooding was a core part of this mandate. And I think it's something that you know that that feeds into the broader question of, of climate change adaptation. And just just a recap, um, when um, it is less about uh, when I say the how versus the what, I don't mean uh, the how are you going to become resilient, right? Because this is a long going process. <laughs> Um, I mean, the how um, um, how are you going to begin to um, uh, try to address some of those challenges um, and elevate some of those challenges? So you raised the issue of uh, diversity and climate change, right? And those are some of the what's, right? Um, how would you? Um, how, what are some of the methodologies that you think might be helpful, particularly that you may have seen from other, some of the other cities, to elevate some of those issues and to get people where they may be uncomfortable um, to, to begin to, um, to address some of those issues? I mean, it's interesting, you know, I think one of the questions that people often have is like, what is resilience? Right, and one of the things that we bump up against a lot is, is this old wine and new bottles? Like, is this just another two-year thing that the city's taking on and, and so on? And I think what we have to, the first thing we need to do is communicate effectively, right? And we have to say like, yes, this is a two-year thing, so we need to get show results within two years, but it sits within our 10-year vision of what resilience is, and this is what we think a resilient city is. That communication, I think, is really important. One thing I also sort of have stumbled on myself, uh, and sort of an, my own personal failings uh, within the first few months, and indeed in any job that I've ever done, is that you can move as fast as you want, but you might just end up alone somewhere, right? It's important, you know, in, particularly in a city like Toronto where there's so much going on already, you have to bring people along with you, right? And that doesn't come by saying, oh, we have this empirical analysis that says, this is exactly what we need to do. It's about building a broad basis of support. Louise touched on it in her uh, lessons. And um, I, I think just to touch on both of those things in terms of building support and communication, being part of the 100 Resilient Cities Network is such a massive opportunity because it gives us a lot of those tools to help communicate and to also show to some of our allies or our not allies the successes that we've had in other cities. This is a cool, um, uh, to use a, once again a planning term, uh, this is a cool opportunity where you have uh, someone who is in, um, uh, whose strategy has already been produced, someone's strategy was about to be produced, and someone who's just starting the strategy work. Um, I, I'm curious, particularly from Dan and Louise, what, if, um, uh, what is the one thing that you would say uh, that you wish you had known then that you know now that you would tell Elliot as you embark in the strategy work, if you want this stuff implemented, if you want to be successful, if you should do this or you should not do this. Sleep is overrated. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you're, you're, I you are so on solid ground in saying that you need to build partnerships, right? There's, there's no way that this happens in uh, a vacuum, and there's, there's no way that it happens even in the vacuum of just city government. Um, you've got to get it out to the key stakeholders, the key business leaders. People need to see value in what is happening for themselves, even on their own terms, to be able to provide support for what you're doing and bringing to the entire city. I put some in my presentation that was at your intention, but uh, actually, <laughs> um, 
to other things. When you, well, you, we, we need to talk more to our citizens and try to uh, find better ways to enter in contact with them. But although when you, if you do that, you're going to invite the most influential, peop influential people. And you might not have a good portrait of your city when you do that. Uh, I remember having uh, the first uh, steering, the steering committee or the first uh, stakeholders committee, and uh, I, I choose all the right committees and participants and schools, and I realized that uh, my, uh, my room was all right, almost all French, and, uh, and that's not Montreal. Well, for, well, for part it's Montreal, but it's not the real portrait of Montreal. So I don't. Uh, I missed. Um, uh, I missed some information there. So I think it's important to be sure that you get everybody around the table. Um, but everything is about relationship again. Yeah. Well, I want to open up uh, an opportunity if there's anyone in the in the audience who uh, may have a question or two. This is a gentleman in the rear. Oh, wait, wait, we have a microphone. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't need it. <laughs> Our only request is this, just identify yourself and then ask your question. Sure. Uh, my name is Ken Long, and I, I co-chaired the city's uh, Inclusive Cities Summit, actually, two weeks ago here at, at the University of Toronto. So. We have two elections next year, uh, but one provincially in June and one municipally in October. And Elliot, you feel free to, to pass on this. Um, you know, for our other CROs, what are some dream policies that you would want to see candidates, uh, both at the municipal level here in the city and provincially or, or at the state, uh, incorporate in their platform? Well, having resilience as, uh, on the political program would be a great thing first and actually the elections are coming next uh, in two months in Quebec so it's a challenge um, yeah that will be that would be a, a great thing but um, uh, an all-inclusive politic uh, having resilience as a goal would would be a great thing so maybe two two stories or two examples I think from across the network there was um, one of our colleagues in Porto Alegre, uh, the CRO there, had gone through a municipal election, and he had actually gone through and done the legwork to get all the candidates uh, that were running to sign a pledge in support of their resilience work, right? He, he, he forced it upon them to, and made it a, cam a campaign issue. I'm not sure if that's advice for you or not. <laughs> But it was, you know, it was certainly one tactic to, to bring it into the conversation and to, to use it as an opportunity to get it on the agenda. Um, the, the other story is sort of my own personal journey in this. I was originally appointed in a, in a similar position, not the same title, as Director of Resilience uh, under Mayor Bloomberg in uh, 2013. And we had gone through, of course, a transition, and uh, Mayor de Blasio came into office in 2014. And, and it was r right around the same time when we began our partnership with 100RC. But there were a lot of these swirling conversations, and part of it was, you know, am I going to have a job? Um, and using that moment uh, of transition to make sure that, one, all this work from Sandy was still happening, and so I wanted to keep doing it, of course. but that it was a moment to really think about, hey, we're going to have a whole new administration in. It's a chance to educate everybody on what this is. And when that new team came in, hey, I was there on day one. So I was easy, I was easy to schedule um, to get on the agenda with the new, you know, new deputy mayors and uh, new commissioners and explain everything that's been going on to date and how that has a trajectory and how that fit into the, the new uh, platform of an incoming mayor. And so it was. Uh, there's a there's a couple different ways where I think we we don't necessarily think we're getting hired into a political position as CROs, and yet you find yourself very much so in a political role, and how you choose to use that uh, can really affect the fate of the work, your own role, your office, and ultimately the the entire city and how it uh, how it thinks about this work. So a couple stories. I have to choose my words carefully uh, <laughs> uh, because I think I'm actually legally not allowed to answer that question um, because we have a bit of a different system here where obviously the CRO is part of the bureaucracy and not uh, a political appointment. Um, I, I'm just going to answer it in a roundabout way that rather than discussing the details of, of the elections, which 
inconveniently bisect my my two years. Um, I, I use the, the term ahead of the storm, uh, and I use it because we had a strategy called ahead of the storm in Toronto in 2008. It was a climate change adaptation strategy. Um, I think we could have done more than what was in the, that, but then something happened a couple years later, and uh, that strategy had never really um, came fully to fruition. Um, and I think that the real aim here is n to institutionalize resilience within the bureaucracy, right? Uh, and within our partners uh, at other orders of government and uh, obviously in the business and philanthropic communities, because that will outlast any potential uh, political change. Wait one second, microphone. Um, Izzy Lyon, I used to work for the provincial government. I was wondering if you uh, include disruptive technologies, uh, automation, big data, all of those things as uh, potentially impacting on uh, you know, uh, equity and joblessness, et cetera. So, um, I'm sorry, just can you get the microphone? Um, are you asking the question in terms of their role in creating a stress or their role in the potential uh, uh, implementation of a strategy to deal with stresses and shocks? Well, uh, I see all of these things as a, a looming threat, a, a looming major change to how things get done, to uh, income inequality, all, uh, all kinds of things should um, either preventing or adapting to those major changes be part of a resilient strategy? I think it's a, it's a great topic um, to discuss because you could just use the one example of like auto, um, autonomous vehicles as a, as, a, as a perfect example. You know, as we're electrifying cars and making them autonomous and thinking that we're going to have these dispatch systems taking people all, all over, it's, you know, the city starts to become more gleaming and more affluent and that's not a resilient city at the end of the day. And so these technologies, while we don't know the trajectory, we don't know what's going to happen and, and how fast it's going to develop, it will be developing probably faster than we can expect. And so we've been doing some thinking about it, our transportation department, our resilience office, some early things just to understand what the state of the play is, what the trajectory is. But I don't think, I, we don't have a solid answer. I think that's the, the, the honest answer is that um, the, the trajectory that some of these technologies are on could be very disruptive and could have some serious unintended consequences that we're trying to think about now. I will say in our, in our case that uh, it will be part of the discussion um, as uh, we are putting a lot of money into rebuilding our infrastructures. There's a lot of congestion and traffic in Montreal going on, so we had this a topic we're gonna cover. We don't, again, let, as New York, we don't have a solid answer, but it's con a conversation that we're gonna start. And um, just wanna revisit the theme that I, I brought up earlier. I mean, when it comes to things like uh, drones, right, one potential thing, the city of Toronto may have a drone strategy, but ultimately they'll be regulated by the province. And it reinforces the fact that we need to um, work very closely with our friends uh, at Queen's Park to ensure that with these disruptive technologies, as with climate change or anything else, that we're moving sort of in lockstep as much as we can with the other orders of government. Hi there, my name's uh, Kapil Kimdas. Uh, I work in uh, community health. Uh, question uh, for all of you, but particularly uh, Daniel. Um, uh, Daniel, uh, how much further back would New York's resiliency planning have been had Superstorm Sandy not occurred? And do you have advice um, for you know cities that um, are doing this kind of planning um, in the hopes that they don't have to experience something similar in order to focus their their attention? Yeah, it, it, I, I like that question a lot because I, I think it's um, across the network. The the resilience strategies for cities that have a either very recent shock or a very well-known shock. It sort of, it focuses a lot of the attention um, and gives some structure, of course, but sometimes you can overemphasize that threat um, versus cities that have not necessarily had the big, uh, you know, front page uh, disaster. 
the other the challenge they face is that it's so wide ranging. It's like you could be talking about any number of threats, um, and it's hard to balance them of which ones are actually more likely, more threatening, which ones are the the low likelihood, high consequence events um, that you may need to put some effort into, even if they're quite unlikely to happen, versus the threats that you know are, you know, you're going to have them every 10 years or every 30 years or, or every day. And so it's, it, you know, I think about like New Orleans, clear focus of their strategy. San Francisco had a clear earthquake uh, focus on their strategy. Uh, we certainly had a, a, a big Sandy and ultimately climate focus in ours as well. Um, not that it's to the exclusion of anything else, but I think each of the cities has had a focus. The, the challenge, and, and maybe flooding becomes that, and maybe adaptation becomes that here, um, but it's helpful to do the sort of just blue sky scenario planning. What are, the, what are the other things that are out there? What are the things that somebody might call you crazy for even talking about right now? Is it a solar flare or is it, you know, or is it the, the potential for a whole sector of the economy to go under that no one sees coming because of technological change? you have to talk about those and figure out, do you want to include that? Do you want to think about those things? And how are they really going to impact your city? But thinking about everything in that sort of, you know, what's the likelihood and what's the consequence and dealing with risk, um, which is a big part of what this is about. Well, you had the opportunity today to, um, to hear a little bit about resilience at the global level from uh, your home city of Toronto. From Montreal and from New York, and uh, I want to thank the CROs for uh, for making time available to to share, um, and I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Slack to close us out. Thank you, everyone. Well, I would also like to thank our speakers. Uh, thanks, Otis, for uh, doing a great job of moderating today. I said, please finish at 6:25, and. You've done that perfectly. But you've also shared with us um, what uh, 100 Resilient Cities is all about, and, and that was terrific. Thank you. Uh, thanks uh, to Dan and Louise from, Dan from New York, Louise from Montreal, uh, to share your lessons for us. I'm sure Elliot was taking notes and, and, and learned a lot. And thank you, Elliot, for telling us what you're thinking, even though it's the very, very early stages. Um, I, I think we heard a lot of things today, and, and, and I sort of just summarized m maybe five themes. And um, the first is that resilience is not just about climate change. Many of you probably came today thinking resilience is about climate change. But it's about much more than that. It's about building affordable housing. It's about improving the quality of life for all of our citizens. As Elliot said, it's about inclusive climate resilience growth. Resilience. Uh, is not just about surviving. Otis told us it's also about adapting and growing, and I think that's something we learned today as well. Uh, Louise told us it's not just a paper strategy. Uh, it's actually how to make change. It's all about implementation, enough reports, and time for implementation. I think the fourth theme was about public engagement, and, and I'm always amazed in a city of eight million people that New York does as much public, public engagement and public consultation as it does, and how well it does it, not just on these issues, but other uh, broader planning issues uh, on everything. Um, and Dan told us about public engagement, but also about the importance of building partnerships. And lastly, uh, everyone stressed that this is not a two-year project. This is about institutionalizing across the city government the notion of resilience, working towards resilience. Uh, we did talk about silo busting, didn't we? So th those were, I think, some of the themes that came out of today. But I must say, I spent a lot of the time thinking about how we could tattoo R's on everybody's chest <laughs> to, for chief resilience officer. But maybe just t-shirts we could get for you the next time you come. <laughs> So um, I also want to thank a few other people. Um, I would like to thank 100 Resilient Cities and Olivia, who's uh, here and helped us uh, organize the event today. I would like to thank our IMFG team, Selena Zhang and Jamila Aladina. These are the people you don't see. They're the people who make me look good. Um, but they are the people who really make events like this happen, and, and thank you so much. 
Um, I'd also like to thank our technical team at the Monk School, in particular Adam Bell. I think he thought everything was running smoothly so he could go, but everything <laughs> did run smoothly. And so that is great. And uh, I, of course, I'd like to thank all of you in the audience for coming and participating today. Uh, one last thing, today's discussion was webcast, which is why we made you speak into the mic. Um, and it will be available, the webcast will be available on our website in a few weeks. So thank you again for coming and have a great evening. <laughs>